It's really wonderful to be here. I was, when I was listening to the last talk, I was thinking that Hugh is the first person who's pulled me out from under one of those rocks <laughs> since 1986. Um, I haven't spoken publicly about the grid or any of this since then because I had a severe crisis of confidence. Um, I, I'm, an, I'm one of those evil anthropologists, <laughs> PhD'd and everything, and um, my sense of critical judgment kicks in so hard on myself that uh, I felt pretty much tongue-tied by my research, and um, I'll tell you part of the story of how I got to where I am now, but uh, I spent about 10 years in retreat with musical instruments, making them, playing violin, and um, working on the sky grid that I'm going to present today for the first time. And uh, I'm very, I am just in awe of what I've heard already at this conference. It practically brought me to tears. Um, just this past summer, I turned my granite boulder filled backyard into a garden. And um, when you said that that was just what you needed, rock dust, I'm thinking I'm going to go home and lick my rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every, everything that I've heard has expanded me so much. I'm, I'm really moved to be here. So. This is our front porch, and I just, uh, I always, I started out in sustainability, and these are our solar cookers, which um, bring magical vortex sun energy to cook our food. <laughs> and so, I've, I guess I've always been interested in vortexes, but I've kind of stood back from them just because I was academic until fairly recently when I went to Corral, which is the Peruvian site that Hugh talked about, at point 35 on our grid, and at the foot of the Menor Pyramid, I don't know if any of you have been there, but I have a slide of it coming up, carved on the main platform in front of that period, or that pyramid is one of those spirals that Hugh showed in his show. Great big spirals, probably this big across. And the, the whole, everything in that site, the life of the people, the plants, the water, the pyramids, the trade system, everything is a, is a vortex, a living vortex. And it's kind of changed my, my view of how to think about vortexes and how to think about all these energy lines that, and telluric currents and everything that we've been talking about today. This, oddly enough, has been my inspirational goddess since I began all this work. This is um, Tlazotel, who's an Aztec uh, aspect of the feminine. They don't really use the divine down there, but I think I've put it in, in my show sometimes. But if you look at her, there are several things in this representation that I think encompass both the philosophy of the earth grid and what will be the sky grid, as well as a way of humans living within all this energy. That's, that's probably my focus, is how humans have interpreted and lived within the context of this energy that all of you are, are focusing upon, and made stories about it, made rituals to attach themselves more fully to it. So what she's actually doing is um, defecating. <laughs> and she's called the goddess of filth, but as you can see up here, Aztec, I, I can't speak Nahuatl, but the language is, from everything I've read about it, it's very poetic in that they'll, they'll build these little kinds of um, etymological closenesses into, their, into the ways that they name things, so that filth, plazo, and plazo, Filth and love are pretty much the same thing. And filth is just our word, but it's really waste, which is turning into corn, which is fertilizing the soil, which is coming back as food. And that's very much influenced me. Here under this foot, she has an instrument that I have been making that's called a bull roar, which will be, the, which will be one of the corners of this talk. You've probably seen him tour spun one at the beginning of his film. And they're just flat. Get it going and not hit the microphone. And, ev and whoever spins it will have a unique voice. 
But this also, as you can see, it has a, it has a vortex as a horizontal plane, and it has a spinning plane. So it's a vortex generator. And the other instrument that's under her other foot, this one, is something that some of you may have played with as a child. It's called a magic wheel. You might have played with one with string through a big coat button. And so I made one in that shape, but you can, and I will, I'll be talking more about all of these. You just get them around a couple of fingers. And that shape that she has here is the glyph for movement. And then the other figures that are surrounding her are the day glyphs in the Aztec calendar. So that's one of my primary inspirations in this talk. And then there's your, and the bull roar, interestingly enough, has been found all over the world. And this, the oldest one was found near Chauvet Cave in France, and it's 40,000 years old. It was carved out of mammoth bone. And so I think that they have seven or eight surviving examples of a bull roar from that period, but mostly they call them fugitive artifacts because they, they just disintegrate. So we really don't have too much of a straight history, but if we're lucky and we pick through history and we find a site with stuff in it, often we find a bull roar. And there, it, it's one, if you do go back into ancient history, you find that um, the magic wheel, this thing, a fire drill that you spin to get to start fire, loom spindle, spinning top, and the bull roar are very commonly considered to be power, power ritual instruments, and they're very practical. And also in, uh, well, I'll tell you this later. Those are some of the old ones, just so you can see how the form over all those, those thousands of years has stayed pretty much the same. Now another, what, the geometric figure that has been important in, in the way that, we de, that Bill Becker and I developed the grid, the most important form is the ROM, which is this figure. And the earliest time that we hear about the bull roar, the name given to it is rhombos. And the earliest name given to the, this was Greek just because that's where the writing is that I can read and that most academics can read. They can't read Hindu very well yet. Um, this was also rhombos. So I'll return to that. But I'm, I have that rhombos. This is the um, Hindu Sri Yantra. Is anybody familiar with that? It's the, it's the graphic symbol for the mother goddess. And I noticed, just look, I got to looking at Ram so much that I realized that I could lay the center of it right over the human midbrain. So now part of my thinking about who we are as consciousness is that here's our midbrain at the end of our spinal cord, and it's, it's, it's a rhombic form. And all the traditions talk about the brain essentially being a spinning being, a, a, a being of intertwined spinning energies. So that's another influence in this. Now just briefly, I don't think I'm going to have to go over the grid too much since so many people have talked about it. But um, I love John Michel. I knew him very briefly. But um, I have to say that my primary influences for the grid were Chris Bird, who wrote The Secret Life of Plants, who was uh, very kind to us with his research. And um, probably I have to acknowledge the Grateful Dead. <laughs> <laughs>